tonight's um, uh, main event um, is Virginia Eubanks, who we're delighted um, to have here uh, this evening. Uh, so Virginia is an author, welfare rights advocate, and associate professor of political science at the University of Albany. Um, really, she's, she's here to be on the panel a little later and have a free-form chat about our social security system, but what we wanted to do originally is talk about her book uh, called Automating uh, Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile Police and Punish the Poor. In it, um, Virginia explains the technocratic shift we've seen uh, towards automating social security and how that works to encode and, and worsen inequality uh, with what she calls a digital poorhouse, which basically you know, entails government you know, controlling the flow of resources and entitlements, policing poor and working class communities, um, and punishing those who need you know, the most unconditional social security. So without any further introduction, I'd like you all to warmly welcome Virginia Eubanks. Our experience in the United States, um, I think we have a lot to talk about that's um, common, um, and so I'm really excited to get to the panel. But I do want to spend a little time giving you guys some context of how this stuff works in the US. And I want to tell you a couple of stories of individuals that, and families who I worked with when I was reporting um, this book. I did a, a more than 105 interviews over seven years uh, for this book. And in each case, each technology I talk about, I talk to lots of different kinds of people. So developers of the tools, policy makers, frontline caseworkers, but in each story, I started with folks who are most directly affected by the tools, um, folks who are looking for public assistance, who are involved in the child welfare system, who are unhoused or homeless. And it's too rare that we hear the voices of people who are actually directly affected, particularly when we talk about these new technologies. And so I just want to make sure that I introduce you to these stories through the stories of people who are directly impacted. Um, so uh, I'm here uh, to talk about uh, what I describe in the book as a digital courthouse, which is a sort of invisible institution that's made up of decision-making algorithms, automated mated eligibility processes, and statistical models, particularly predictive models, in the US social service programs. Um, and this might get confusing because Social Security is the good one in the United States right. and public assistance or social services is the bad one. Um, so that might be a little complex, so we'll figure it out if it gets confusing. Um, so I want to talk today about how the rise of this invisible institution um, is sort of sunk in the, into the policy history of the United States um, and how it responds and recreates specifically a narrative of austerity this idea, this false idea, that there's not enough for everyone and that we have to make hard decisions about who deserves to access their basic human needs and who does not. So we often talk about the kinds of tools that I write about in the book as disruptors, um, but they're really more evolution than revolution and their, their roots go very, very deep in US history um, and specifically to a moment um, in the early 1800s um, where we decided to sort of invent a new technology for managing poverty, um, which was in the U.S. context, the county poorhouse. And sort of this is the moment that I always thank my editor, um, Elizabeth Disagard, because originally this book started with a 95-page history chapter that went back to 1601. Um, and she pretty much cried and was like, oh God, please don't do that to people. Um, and so it's now sort of down to a spelt little 26-page um, history that starts, oh, you know, only in 1819. Um, but I think it's really important that we contextualize these tools that get talked about as if they sort of appeared from nowhere, like the monolith in 2001 in the Space Odyssey. Um, but they, their, their roots are really deep in our uh, respective histories. So I'm just going to talk about one of these historical moments briefly which is in 1819, we had a really horrible um, economic depression in the United States, one that was accompanied by a lot of organizing by poor and working class people uh, for their rights and their survival. And this, of course, made economic elites really, really nervous. Um, they did what economic elites always do when they get really nervous. They commissioned a whole bunch of studies. 
Um, and so the studies, yeah, that, that line never gets a laugh at academic talks, by the way. Um, I, it was really fun to do that line at, um, at Harvard, though. Um, I was like, I was like, wait, let me say that again. Um, so uh, they, and they frame the question in a very specific way. So they frame the question behind all these uh, studies. What's the real problem during this catastrophic economic recession? Is it poverty? Is it lack of access to resources? Or is it what they called at the time pauperism, which was dependence on public benefits? So how do you think the surveys, the studies came back? Was it actual poverty or was it pauper pauperism? Yes, yeah, so you're very smart people. Um, this is exactly what the studies came back and said. The problem is when we're too generous, allowing people not to starve through this economic depression, they become dependent on public benefits, they lose their work ethic, they have a bunch of babies and get drunk. So, um, yeah, again, this is, sounds familiar. Um, and uh, so they invented this new technology um, at the time, or a technology, honestly, that was um, imported from uh, England, uh, which was our version of the workhouse. It was called the county poorhouse. And this is basically a brick and mortar institution for uh, more or less incarcerating people who asked for support from public funds. So they were strictly voluntary in the sense that homeless shelters are strictly voluntary, although you could be sentenced to the poorhouse for crimes like vacancy, having nowhere to live, begging, asking for help, or prostitution, which at the time meant having sex while not being married. Um, so you could get sentenced to the poorhouse, but for folks who volu voluntarily enter, um, they, it was not an easy decision. So uh, it was 1819, so not everybody had these rights, but if you had the right to vote and hold office, you had to give it up in order to enter the poorhouse. You couldn't marry when you were in the poorhouse. You were often separated from your children because it was understood that poor and working class children could be redeemed. Um, by having more contact with richer families, and by contact they generally meant uh, labor uh, as domestic or agricultural workers. Um, and some of these institutions, one of the most notorious being Tewksbury in Massachusetts, had death rates as high as 30% a year. So um, a third, basically a third of people entering died um, every year. So the reason that I use this as sort of the origin story I tell about the digital poorhouse is because it's a moment that the United States made two really important decisions. The first was that the, the first and most important thing our social service system could do is a kind of moral diagnosis, deciding who deserves help and who doesn't, who is deserving and who is undeserving, rather than, say, building a system that created a universal floor under everyone. And the second um, thing we decided at that moment was that it was acceptable and appropriate to ask people to give up one of their basic human rights for another, right? So their right to their children or their right to vote for their right to things like food and shelter. And this is what I think of as sort of the deep social programming that underlies the new tools that we're seeing in social services. Um, and for the sort of techies in the, in the room, that would be the legacy program programming on which the rest of the tool is built. Why these specific tools have become popular at this precise time, um, and I think there's three reasons for that, and I'll introduce you to the technologies through these three stories. Um, the first is these new tools rationalize and recreate a politics of austerity, the idea that there's not enough for everyone. Second, they um, purport to address bias in these systems, but in fact, they often hide or displace the bias to a new place. Um, and third, at their worst, they create a kind of empathy override that allows us to ease the emotional burden of making what I think are inhumanly difficult decisions. Decisions like who gets access to emergency shelter and who is forced to live um, on the street in a tent or in a car. So um, I'll go through each of those one at a time. I dedicate this book to um, a little girl named Sophie Stite, a severely disabled little girl who, um, when she was six, received a letter from the state of Indiana that explained that she would be losing her Medicaid, which is the um, health care insurance program for poor and working families in the United States, because she had failed to cooperate in establishing eligibility for the program. 
So this was happening just as she was gaining weight, really on par with normal um, patterns for the first time in her life. She had just had a gastrointestinal feeding tube um, uh, implanted, and she was learning to walk for the first time. Um, so her family was caught up in an attempt by the state of Indiana to um, uh, automate and modernize um, and privatize all of the eligibility functions for the state's welfare program. So that's Medicaid, that uh, health insurance program I was talking about, cash assistance, with, which in the US is called TANF, and food stamps, uh, a program now called SNAP, but at the time it was called food stamps. So in 2006, um, the governor of the state at the time, Mitch Daniels, signed what was eventually a 1.34 billion, with a B, billion dollar contract with a consortium of companies, including IBM and Affiliated Computer Services, or ACS, now owned by Xerox, to create a system that basically replaced the work of local county caseworkers with online forms and regional call centers, which might sound familiar based on your announcement today. Um, and what that looked like from a caseworker's point of view was in the past, they had been responsible for a docket of families, or a caseload, um, which were individuals and families that they often developed relationships with over time and helped them navigate the really difficult, complex, and punitive social service system. Instead, they were now moved to regionalized call centers, often hundreds of miles away from where they lived, um, and responded rather than um, to a docket of families to a sort of a list of tasks that dropped into their electronic workflow management system. So for caseworkers, it felt very much like um, they were not able to develop relationships with people over time because every call just went to the next available worker. Um, it felt like their local knowledge was no longer useful. So they could say like, well, it looks like you're not gonna be eligible for food stamps, but they couldn't then say, but there's a food pantry in your town, it's open Tuesday nights. So they felt like it really changed the nature of their job. From applicants' point of view, it felt like if anything went wrong in this process, because it was so difficult to talk to the same person more than once, that basically all the responsibility for finding out what had gone wrong and fixing it fell on families themselves, which are some of the most vulnerable families in the state. Um, and the result was a million benefits denials in the first three years of the experiment. It was a 54% increase from the three years before the experiment and almost all of them were denied for this catch-all reason that was in Sophie Stipes' letter, failure to cooperate in establishing eligibility. Basically, all that meant is that a mistake was made somewhere in the application. Could be uh, the applicant forgot to sign page 18 in a 34-page application. Could be that this the new regional call center workers didn't know the policy so well, so folks uh, got bad advice. Could be a technical problem. For example, the, um, the document um, processing center, the sort of scanning center, um, lost so many documents that advocates started calling it the black hole in Marion. Um, so if any one of your documents went missing somewhere in the process, that was also seen as failure to cooperate in establishing eligibility. And it was really up to families to figure out what had gone wrong. Um, so this created enormous hardship for families. Um, and I just want to read you briefly a story of one of those people, Maggie Young from Evansville, Indiana. So in the fall of 2008, Maggie Young missed an appointment to recertify for Medicaid because she was in the hospital suffering from terminal cancer. The cancer that began in her ovaries had spread to her kidneys, breast, and liver. Her chemotherapy left her weak and emaciated. Young, a round-faced, umber-skinned mother of two grown sons, struggled to meet the new system's requirements. So she called her local county help center to let them know she was hospitalized, and that's why she couldn't make her um, phone-based recertification appointment. But her medical benefits and food stamps were still cut off for failure to cooperate in establishing eligibility. Because she lost her benefits, she was unable to afford her medication, she struggled to pay her rent, she lost access to free transportation to medical appointments. And Omega Young died on March 1st, 2009. On the next day, on March 2nd, she won an appeal for wrongful termination and all of her benefits were restored. That's Indiana. So, um, 
The second story I want to tell today, let's start uh, with the point of view of families, because we need a little lift after that, and this is a funny and wonderful family. But um, the second tool I want to talk about today is a tool called the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, the AFST. Um, and the Allegheny Family Screening Tool is a um, statistical model that's supposed to be able to predict which children might be victims of abuse or neglect in the future in Allegheny County, which is the county where Pittsburgh is in Pennsylvania. Um, so let me introduce you to a family. I want to introduce you to Angel um, and Patrick, um, Angel Shepard and Patrick Reed. So I met them at a, a community support center for families who are involved in the child welfare system. Um, do I need to, I don't know how your child protection works here. Do I need to give you any background into child welfare? We have a similar system here. You, you get the basics. We'll talk about it uh, in uh, a little bit later if anything's unclear. Um, so I met them at this sort of community hub where families gather to like share resources, connect with each other, do peer support, that kind of stuff. Um, and Angel and Patrick didn't stand out right away because their experience really was so average. Um, it was so characteristic of what I see as the routine, mundane indignities that are suffered by the white working class in the United States. So they've struggled with low wage, dangerous work, poor quality public schools and predatory online education, poor health and community violence. Um, but through it all, they've been creative, involved parents. So I describe Patrick in the book as kind of a Buddhist ex-biker, right? So he's this enormous rectangle, like refrigerator-sized man um, who has like really elaborate facial hair, and he's really calm. He's like deeply calm. Um, and Angel and Patrick are caring for two young girls, or helping to care for two young girls, Angel's daughter, Harriet, and Patrick's daughter's daughter, Desiree. And the two girls are roughly the same age, so they bicker a lot, they fight a lot. So Angel and Patrick's solution for this is what they call the get-along shirt. And the get-along shirt is one of Patrick's like enormous button-down shirts. And they take both girls and they put them in the shirt. Um, <laughs> one arm through one armhole, one arm in the waist of the other girl. And they button the shirt back up. Um, and you're not allowed to leave the get-along shirt until you stop fighting. <laughs> Even if you have to go to the bathroom. Um, and this is the thing that Patrick said always works. As soon as someone has to pee, the fighting stops because no one wants to pee in the get-along shirt. Um, so despite this, um, Angel and Patrick have racked up sort of a lifetime of interactions with the child welfare system in Allegheny County, which is called Children, Youth, and Family Services, or CYF. So Patrick was investigated for medical neglect in the early 2000s. Um, because he was unable to afford his daughter Tabitha's um, uh, antibiotic prescription after a visit to the emergency room. So he brought her to the emergency room because she was sick. They prescribed the antibiotics. He couldn't afford to fill the prescription. She got worse. He brought her back. The nurse said, oh, we saw you before. We know you didn't fill the prescription. And they reported them for child neglect, um, for medical neglect. Um, when Harriet, Angel's daughter, was five, someone phoned a string of reports to the county's child abuse and neglect hotline. So it's possible to be anonymous on these hotlines. So this sort of anonymous tipster explained that Harriet was running around the neighborhood unsupervised, that she was down the block teasing a dog, that she wasn't being properly clothed, fed, or bathed, that she wasn't getting needed medication. So for each call, an investigator from CYF came out to the house interviewed Harriet and Tabitha, Angel and Patrick, looked in all their cupboards and under all the beds, um, and requested access to the family's medical records. And then each time, they found no evidence of maltreatment, so they closed the case. But the record of these cases uh, is now kept in digital form um, and maintained on an integrated data um, warehouse that was built by the county in 1999, which feeds the Allegheny Family Screening Tool. So, and I'll talk about the, how that system works in a sec. So Patrick and Angel described to me like that they felt like they did sort of a constant algebra of terror, where they were trying to figure out what resource, what, requesting which resources would drive their score up and make it more likely that they'd be investigated for child maltreatment, which would make it more likely that one of their kids would be taken out of their home and put into foster care. Um, so Angel told, um, told me, um, it's a quote, you feel like a prisoner. You feel trapped. It's like no matter what you do, it's not good enough for them. My daughter's now nine, and I'm still afraid that they're going to come up one day 
see her out by herself, pick her up, and say, you can't have her anymore. So the system in Allegheny County um, sort of began in 1999 when the county built this integrated data warehouse that gets um, regular data extracts from about 30 different agencies around the county and around the state. So as of the writing of the book, um, that integrated data warehouse held about a billion records, uh, which was more than 800 for every individual living in Allegheny County. But it doesn't actually collect data equally on everyone li living in the county. In fact, the way that public services works in the US, it really only collects information about foreign working families. So um, for example, if you're struggling with um, an addiction or recovery issue and you're a professional middle class family, you would go to your family doctor. That would be, they might refer you to addiction recovery. That would be covered by employer provided private insurance. And that information would not go into this data in this database. If you're a poor and working class family, you'd rely on county services for that those recovery services, and that data would go into the database. Um, if you uh, are a professional middle class family and you need uh, just some like uh, respite in your parenting, you might get a nanny or pay for a babysitter, and you'll pay out of pocket. If you are a poor and working class person and you need daycare when you go to work, you're going to get that from a county-based uh, daycare provider, um, and that information will go into the database. So the parents that I spoke to about the system said that it felt like it confused parenting while poor with poor parenting, and that it created what they called a feedback loop of injustice, where because they were reaching out for support from public services, their scores were higher, because their scores were higher, they were investigated more often. Because they were investigated more often, more data was uh, in the system about them. Because there was more data about them in the system, their score was higher, and the loop sort of closes. Um, so um, they were really concerned with what are known as false positives. So the this system that um, uh, pulls variables from that data warehouse and runs an algorithm to create a risk score. Um, parents, as you might imagine, were really concerned that it would predict harm where no harm was actually occurring. Um, so that's a false positives problem. But I also spent a whole day sitting in the call center with intake screeners in the system or the front line of the caseworkers in the system. They're the folks who get the calls from the county um, hotline or who get reports from mandated reporters and make this really difficult decision about which ones to, to screen in for full investigations and which ones to screen out. Keep the data, but not investigate right now. And call screeners were worried about the same problem, but from the opposite perspective. They were concerned about false negatives. Because the system has almost no data on professional middle class families, they were concerned that the system would not be able to recognize the kind of harm, or predict, the kind of harm that actually might be happening in professional middle class families. So for example, there's good data in the United States that um, uh, geographic isolation is correlated with maltreatment, but those folks won't end up in the data warehouse, so that kind of harm um, won't be recognized, they won't be able to predict it. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about this system is the designers of the system will say, that one of the reasons they built it um, is to identify and intervene, and intervene in racial disproportionality in the system. And that just means in the United States, 47 of 50 states um, pull um, black, biracial, and Native American children out of their families and put them into foster care at rates that far exceed uh, their proportion in the population. So that's known as racial disproportionality. It's a problem in Allegheny County like it is everywhere else. So the designers of the system say, we don't know that this system necessarily will solve racial disproportionality, but be we believe with better data, we can identify discriminatory decision making in the system and we can step in. Now what's really interesting is that the county's own data shows that intake screening, the point at which this tool is aimed, is not actually the place where racial disproportionality is entering the system. It actually enters at what's known as call referral, which is when people call on families to these hotlines or report them through mandated reporting processes. 
So in Allegheny County, black and biracial families are 350% more likely to be reported to child welfare services by the community. Once those cases get in the system, there is a little bit of disproportionality that's added at call screening. So call screeners screen in 69% of cases around black and biracial children and only 65% of cases around white children. That's a 4% difference versus a 350% difference. And I think that's something that's really interesting around these systems and it, it behooves us to pay really close attention when designers of these tools talk about them as tools for increasing racial equity. I think we should be really cautious um, when um, folks start making those arguments. Because what I saw in Allegheny County was a very sophisticated tool, um, a, a very resource intensive and sophisticated tool, and at the place where the problem wasn't happening. And at worst, it could actually remove some human discretion from the front line of that system. These intake call screeners, who are, by the way, the most racially diverse, the most working class, and the most female part of their workforce. Um, and uh, removing their discretion could very much create actually amplification of the kind of discrimination that's entering the system that call um, referral. So one of the questions I, I try to leave people with in the book is um, to say we shouldn't be asking discretion yes or no, we should be asking discretion who? Because I have this very smart um, political science friend named Joe Sauce um, he said discretion is like energy. It can never be created or destroyed. It's only ever moved. So in this case, they're actually moving the discretion from the front line of their workers and giving it to the economists and data scientists and computer programmers who are developing the system. Um, okay, so the third tool that I talk about in the book is called coordinated entry. Um, and it is a tool that's supposed to be able to match the most vulnerable unhoused people with the most appropriate available housing resource. And I, this is actually a system that is in, um, in action pretty much everywhere in the United States and increasingly around North America. Um, I spent time reporting on it in Los Angeles County because Los Angeles County has one of the worst um, housing crises in the United States. So um, as of the writing of the book, there are 58,000 unhoused people in Los Angeles County. So I live in a small city in upstate New York of 50,000 people. So my entire city plus 8,000 people are homeless in LA. Um, and it's actually not the place where there are the most homeless people in the United States. That's actually New York City. There's 76,000 homeless people in New York City at least. But the thing that is unique about Los Angeles is that um, the 75% of the unhoused population has no shelter at all, so no emergency shelter. They're just living um, in encampments, in tents, or in cars, uh, or just living out, living rough. Um, so this is a, an extraordinary human rights crisis, and I absolutely understand um, that frontline homeless services workers want some help making really difficult decisions about who gets access to resources. So I do not want to be the, ca the caseworker who sees 100 people a week and only has resources to give to two of them and has to decide that. So I absolutely understand why this tool um, is attractive. Um, and the proponents of the tool called the Match.com of homeless services. Um, and the tool actually works pretty well for those folks who are most vulnerable, those folks who are sort of at the top of the scale. Um, and uh, actually for the folks all the way at the bottom who um, can be helped out of sort of acute temporary homelessness with a, a small investment, a small time limited investment of resources. Um, what I was really interested in was um, the roughly 20,000 people who have gone through this process and have gotten no resources at all. So basically the way the system works is um, you do this very intensive um, and some think intrusive survey with a terrible acronym, it's called the VISPDAT. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's terrible, it's the Vulnerability Index and Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. <laughs> Not my first time saying that out loud. Thank you. Um, I, I haven't messed it up in like 11 months. Um, so uh, the, the VI Spadat has some 
questions that are pretty good at identifying vulnerability, um, but are pretty tricky to actually answer in practice. So it asks things like, um, are you currently trading sex for money or drugs? Um, uh, is there an open warrant on you? Have you thought about harming yourself or someone else? Where can you be found at different times of the day? And can we take a picture? Um, so I was um, really interested um, in the people who had done this survey, um, sometimes multiple times, um, and hadn't really seen any resources materialized through it. I wanted to know how they felt uh, uh, about the tool. And these are folks like um, Uncle, uh, Uncle Gary Boatwright, um, who goes by the nickname Uncle Gary. Um, and I'll tell you just briefly about him. Um, so when I met Uncle Gary, he had been living in a gray and green tent on East 6th Street on the edge of Skid Row in LA um, for years. Uh, he's a straight, talking, wryly funny man with thinning white hair and Santa Claus blue eyes. Um, he's had a dozen careers as a welder, a mason, a paralegal, a door-to-door -door salesman, a law student, and most recently he was a document processor for a wholesale mortgage lender, um, which actually introduces all kinds of ironies into his story because this is one of the mortgage lenders uh, that got named uh, one of the subprime 25, which actually created the subprime mortgage crisis, which actually made a lot of people in Los Angeles homeless. Um, so since moving to Skid Row several years before I met him, Gary um, had filled out the VI Spadat three times and had really lost patience with the process. Um, so he doesn't think he scored very high. Um, he's 64 and other than a little high blood pressure and a hearing problem, he's mostly healthy. Um, his substance use to me didn't seem debilitating or abusive. Um, and he has a mental health diagnosis, um, but he doesn't actually know what it is. Um, he only found out about it when he went to court in Orange County, and no one had ever uh, shared uh, his diagnosis with him. Um, but the problem, as he sees it, is not his comparative vulnerability, how vulnerable he is compared to the guy living in the tent next to him. It's simple math. There's not enough housing in Los Angeles for the county's 58,000 unhoused people. So he told me, people like me, who are somewhat higher functioning, we're not getting housing. It's another way of kicking the can down the road. In order to house the homeless, you have to have available units. Show me the units, otherwise you're just lying. So in November of 2016, as the book was about to go to press, um, Gary was arrested and he was charged with breaking the window of a public bus with a plastic 99 cent store broom, um, which when he called me from Men's Central Jail in LA, he said was quote, physically impossible. Um, he got out about a year ago, um, and when he got out, he had lost everything. So his tent, his paperwork, his relationships with local organizations and friends. Um, and if he decides to interact with the VI Spadat and coordinated entry again, he'll actually score lower on the survey um, because it counts incarceration as being housed. So the model will see him as less vulnerable and his priority score will slip even lower. Um, so one of the things that Gary said that was so important and so interesting was that he said like, that he felt like he was incriminating himself um, in order to get a slightly higher lottery ticket for housing. And this is actually not a bad analysis. So the results of the VI SPDAP go into a system called the Homeless Management Information System, which is a federal system. Um, and under federal data law in the United States, um, actually law enforcement can access data in that system with no warrant at all, no oversight at all, no written record. They can just, a line officer can just walk into a social service office and ask for information out of that database. Um, now, it's important to know they can't ask for anything they want out of it. They can't like go in and say, run a SQL string that says, return a list of everyone who said yes on, are you trading sex for drugs or money, and give me the list. They can't do that. Uh, but they can ask for names, social security numbers, pictures, last known addresses. And it's also important to know that social service workers aren't required to give it to them, but they are allowed to give it to them. Um, and the sort of integration of these two systems of economic support for unhoused people and criminal justice really doesn't make sense outside of a system that criminalizes poverty and especially criminalizes homelessness. So my greatest fear is that these tools can act as a kind of empathy override, um, radically limiting our political vision of what solutions to problems are, 
and letting us avoid our responsibility uh, for caring for one another. Um, so I can hear skeptics now. Um, scary stories sell books. Like Virginia, you went out, you cherry picked the absolute worst stories you could find to tell the Stephen King version of uh, digital governance. Um, and, but, and here's the reality. Um, Okay, Indiana is a little bit that story. Indiana is a little bit the it of um, digital social services. It's pretty bad. Um, like, I don't know what was in Governor Mitch Daniels' heart, um, but one of the advocates I worked with in Bloomington, Indiana, said, you know what? If we had built a system to divert people from public assistance on purpose, it would not have worked any better than the system that we got. But I will say, in both Los Angeles and in Allegheny County, the designers that I spoke to and the policymakers I spoke to were all very smart, very well-intentioned people who actually really cared about the folks their agencies were responsible for. Um, and in both places, actually, designers had done almost everything that progressive critics of algorithms and algorithmic decision-making have asked them to do. They were mostly transparent, so they released details of the system for folks to look at. They were mostly accountable in that they were holding these tools in public agencies so there was at least some kind of democratic control about them. Um, and there was even some sort of uh, cases of participatory design where um, frontline workers and other users were included in the design process. Um, so these are actually some of our best systems, not some of our worst. And I think that begs some really important questions that you all should keep in mind as you're moving in this direction here in the United States. Um, which is what is the problem with the coming age of AI and machine learning and public services is not actually broken systems, but systems that are working exactly the way that they're supposed to. That carry out the imperative of the digital poorhouse to limit access and police the behavior of poor and working people too well. So the designers for all of the systems um, that I researched when I was doing the reporting for this book agreed on one thing. Um, data analytics, matching algorithms, automated decision making are sort of regrettable but necessary systems for triage, for deciding who needs help immediately and who can wait for help. Um, but the decision to triage at all is a political choice, right? We live in a world of abundance, not scarcity. And in the absence of a commitment of resources, a magnitude, a scale of magnitudes larger than what we have right now in the United States, what we're doing is not actually digital triage, it's actually automa automated rationing. And I think it's important that we talk about it in that way. Um, so I wrote the book because I think we deserve better, right? Our people deserve better, our communities deserve better, our democracies deserve better. And I think the fundamental challenge of the digital poorhouse is it um, demands that we think small, that we work within these sort of arbitrarily imposed limits, um, both to our resources and to our vision. Um, but this political moment, and justice itself, of course, demands that we think big, that we push back against austerity fever. So here's the part I've, I've worked out a little bit less, because I'm responding to um, a talk that I did on Monday in Wellington in New Zealand. Um, where I was on a panel with a, um, a, an unnamed individual um, who has been responsible for developing the ethical frameworks around many of these systems in New Zealand. And one of the things that really stood out for me in that conversation is I shared a lot of the stories I just shared with you um, of the struggles of people um, I know and love um, and their families to survive. Um, and every time we tried to engage in conversation, he would basically say, well, let's put that reality aside for now. <laughs> and let's talk about this as if we could bracket things like racial inequality and economic inequality. Then would you be okay with these kinds of systems? And I kept saying, that question makes no sense because we don't actually live in that world. And he was like, yeah, but philosophically, Right? Kant's categorical imperative requires that, blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, I uh, managed to stay mostly civil, though I do think I might have bled out of my eyes a little bit uh, <laughs> during part of that conversation. Um, 
And I've had this conversation a lot of times. One of the things that's really important to me about the book is that it demands that we engage these questions <coughs> concretely through the real experiences of people who are directly affected by these systems. And I think we're doing that much too little right now. Um, in this room, I don't think that's a problem. So I wanted to sort of rethink what I normally talk about as solutions and offer um, some new ideas today. Um, so I want to say that um, in the face of this kind of abstraction, um, we have to cultivate and articulate what I'm thinking of now as a kind of defiant concreteness. Right? We have to refuse to allow them to make our survival a thought experiment, a question of professional ethics, or a technically elegant problem. So we have to reject these really cynical values that are at the heart of these new technologies, especially the disingenuous, I think, way that they rationalize morally corrupt work by suggesting that their tools actually address inequality and bias. They insist on this, but when we ask them to show us how this works exactly, they say, you know what, don't worry. Trust us. We have better data about your lives than you do. We'll take care of it. Uh, really what they're saying is, disappear, go die. So the solution, I think, is to continue to insist on the value of our lives, our knowledge, and our communities. And that's why I'm so excited um, to be here and be part of this conversation today. I have one more little reedy thing to do that is like very inspiring. Should I do that before I stop or should I just sit down? No, do that? Because um, I was actually rereading the last chapter of my book today. It's been a while. Um, and I was like, Damn, the last chapter's pretty good. Um, so I want to share a little bit um, of that. Um, so the last chapter of the book is called Dismantling the Digital Warehouse. And I'm just going to read you a couple of paragraphs. So on March 31st, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his last Sunday sermon called Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. So King declared that the world was undergoing a triple revolution a technological revolution sparked by automation and what he called cybernation, a revolution in warfare triggered by nuclear weapons, and a human rights revolution inspired by anti-colonial struggles for freedom across the globe. Though technological innovation was bringing the world a sense of what he called geographic oneness, um, he, he preached that our ethical commitment to each other was not keeping pace. So quote, and I'm not going to try to sound like Martin Luther King, do that. Um, through our scientific and te technological genius, we have made of this world a neighborhood, and yet we have not had the ethical commitment to make of it a brotherhood. But somehow, and in some way, we have got to do this. We are tied together in the single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. In this sermon, King called on those who would be what he called conscientious objectors uh, in the war against poverty. He called them to a moral reckoning. And he warned them that a movement was coming to shake their moral foundations. So in his voice, he stood in the nation's capital and he intoned the following. One day, we'll have to stand before the God of history and we'll talk in terms of things we've done. Yes, we'll be able to say we built gargantuan bridges to span the seas. We built gigantic buildings to kiss the skies. Yes, we made our submarines to penetrate oceanic depths. We brought into being many other things with our scientific and technological power. It seems that I can hear the God of history saying, that was not enough. I was hungry and you fed me not. I was naked and you clothed me not. I was devoid of a decent sanitary house to live in, and you provided no shelter for me. And consequently, you cannot enter the kingdom of greatness. Fifty years later, King's question has only become more urgent. He didn't foresee that the very technological wonders he extolled might be turned against the poor. Our ethical evolution still lags behind our technological revolutions. But more importantly, because we failed to address King's most crucial challenges, dismantling racism, ending poverty, and destroying war, 
the digital revolution has warped to fit the shape of our still inequitable world. We too will stand in the eyes of justice and talk of what we've done. We've programmed bots to converse like humans. We've built cars that can drive themselves. We even have apps that allow us to document police abuse and mobilize protest. The God of history is still saying, that is not enough. Thank you.